With great data comes even greater access latency. Welcome to the Trino Community Broadcast, where we transform your latency woes into fast insights. My name is Brian Olson. I'm your host. And I'm the co-host, Manfred Moser. And today we have two awesome guests with us as well. Yes, welcome, uh, Renak, and welcome, Carol. Hi. So, Hi. So today we are going to be uh, covering dynamic filtering, uh, which is a subject that uh, these two are pretty much, I would say, the experts uh, on the subject matter, uh, largely under the Trino uh, umbrella. So uh, we're going to be picking their brains a bit. Uh, also, I'll be showing you all a bit of a demo uh, in terms of uh, how this works, or at least how well it works. Uh, we're actually going to be running a couple queries against uh, a cluster we have running right now in AWS. So uh, it's going to be a pretty exciting episode. Um, we're going to kind of do a bit of a review. Uh, this, this show has been one we've been really excited about. We did this show, uh, how long ago was it? Like uh, October, I think the last time we had you guys on. And uh, I, I, I had this horrible moment where I like just didn't press the record button. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that was like the lost episode. And part of me was kind of glad that we did lose that because uh, A, you know, I, don't, I just think that uh, this episode needed a little more buildup, needed a little more background for, for some of those that aren't coming from the space. And uh, so we, we did a couple episodes building up to this. And uh, again, we'll be reviewing those a little bit uh, before we jump right into this. Um, so, um, so yeah, so typically, uh, at, at this point, uh, we, we will have, we would have like a, a starburst kind of, uh, um, uh, uh, basically advertisement. Uh, we, we are not, we, the last one we were doing was data Nova, which has passed and was awesome. So basically all I'm going to say about that is, uh, uh, that, uh, you know, we have data Nova content still available. Um, we will be adding into the show notes, uh, some, uh, a link to basically go access that. Uh, it's, it was a, you know, ridiculously cool conference and super successful, uh, from a higher level. If you're, you know, coming from data leadership, uh, uh, type, type stuff, uh, you're going to be finding things like, you know, data mesh and learning about these newer kind of, uh, trends in, in data analytics. And then, you know, from a more technical pr uh, perspective, uh, we have, uh, recordings from a couple of the actual, um, uh, on hands, uh, hands-on, uh, type labs that we did with Martin, Dane and David. Uh, we have some of the talks that were given by Comcast, uh, talking about their Trino to Trino connector and, uh, just a lot of other cool stuff. Uh, so we, we have that all on demand now. So I'll be adding that in a link to the show notes. Um, other than that, uh, let me, uh, pass this over to, uh, Manfred. Manfred, do you, do you want to, uh, we, we covered 352 a little bit last episode. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you want to kind of go over one of the more recent developments there? Yeah, so the 352 release uh, was a while in the making. And last time we were just waiting for the merge of the release notes. And then that did happen and the release came out. Um, it has a lot of features that we already talked about last time, including some new SQL, SQL uh, syntax support for additional statements and stuff like that. So uh, it's a great release. Unfortunately, there was one correctness bug um, detected that was actually introduced in 352 and is already fixed. So what's currently happening is that we're gonna put out a 350 release, uh, 353 release very shortly. Yep. Just so that basically this correctness issue doesn't um, like get basically used in the wild. Um, it doesn't, it's only like on some SQL statements on specific joins and stuff. So it's not like it's going to be having a wild uh, impact, even if you're using the 352 release already. But uh, once 353 is out, you should definitely upgrade to it. So um, for sure. Yeah. As, uh, do, do you know, have any idea on the timeline there? Oh, I think they're working on it literally like now. Right now. Okay. Like, so it, it might be even by tomorrow that it's already out. So probably by the time anybody on the YouTube side of this is, is watching in, I know a lot of people watch this on yeah. Twitch uh, right after, but if you're watching on the YouTube side, uh, then then this should probably already be p uh, published. So just go to um, here, the this little uh, area that I'm in. I'm Trino.io uh, slash docs um, and... Um, and uh, for current, and if uh, should say probably 353 by that time. And yeah, exactly. If you look in the top header of the title, it says Trino 352 there. Mm -hmm. 
And the publishing of the documentation is like the last step of the release process. The binary is by that stage already landed. Gotcha. So if you see 353 there, you know it's out. And the release notes will have all the details as well. Gotcha. Cool. All right. Um, so yeah, quick overview. Uh, so we are going to be doing this, this background. Let me uh, go ahead and um, pull up my notes. Actually, give me a second to pull up my notes. I'm going to have to... If you want to uh, quickly cover anything else, Manfred, while I'm uh, searching this. Well, so um, so just going back to the episode we did ages ago with Ronak and Carol, we sort of like dove into the deep end. These two uh, <laughs> have been in the community a long time and know Presto in and out. Uh, some of the like rather complex sort of things around like optimizations in the query processing and stuff like that. Um, and if you want to understand what's going on with dynamic filtering, there's a bit more to it. Um, and all the previous episodes, uh, that we've talked about what the hive connector is and, um, all the way down to like different joints, broadcast joints and, uh, these, these sort of like foundational or like not foundational, but like also important aspects, uh, pretty much create a good understanding base so that we can talk about. Uh, dynamic filtering now without uh, the need to like explain every little detail already because you can go back to the past episode and um, always remember that if you go to trino.io the uh, getting started page has the link to the Trini community broadcast and all our past recordings are available and there's a lot of material where we talk about different concepts the notes have links to the documentation and other aspects as well so um if, if you're going to end up potentially losing our discussion, then you can go back to these old episodes and I might end up having to do that myself because <laughs> who knows what Carol and Ranak are going to explain to us and my, my head might start smoking and I might go, oh, okay. <laughs> Something to look forward to. So, yeah, exactly. so let me, uh, I'm going to quickly kind of do the recap uh, before we jump right into the discussion. Um, and then, uh, so, so hang tight guys, just about like uh, 10 minutes for me to cover this real fast and then we'll, we'll jump right in. So, um, so episodes five through nine, uh, minus the eighth episode, uh, which we did for the Trino rebrand, um, we covered a couple concepts that I think are, are super useful to understand, uh, before jumping right into dynamic filtering. So the first one we talked about, uh, hive partitions, uh, and, and this is kind of not, we talked specifically about the hive model and how hive is, is kind of, uh, doing this, but in general part partitioning as a general concept is also something that you can pull from this because as we get into the more broader concepts of, uh, and, and move on to different things like iceberg, you'll see different ways that people are handling partitions and so this could still apply to to dynamic filtering uh, but it's just going to be executed in, in a specifically different way but for the sake of conversation and, and, and kind of how people are doing this a lot today uh, people most people are using the hive model I would say in terms of our out of the Trino user base and uh, and so uh, when we look at hive partitions they're they're typically when you have a table you need to the, the goal is to basically split the table up in such a way that you are ordering rows based on a particular column that you are saying, hey, this column is going to be pretty commonly used, uh, if not like in every single query that we run against this table. So when we run this, we would like to, you know, co-locate the rows uh, that, that are uh, that are that meet this particular criteria into one little section. And so uh, so what Hive does, since it's kind of dependent or initially started out with like HDFS and uh, and now is on, you know, kind of you know, as extended out to S3, but, you know, also uses the same kind of directory concept, um, you'll you'll store your table data underneath a, uh, a directory and then there will be subdirectories per partition. And those will be named, have a particular naming schema, which is like column name equals, and then the actual value. And so you, you would see something like if you were to take the orders table and partition it on a field called order date, then uh, you would see some sort of a, a file listing like this in your, in your actual file store. So you would have the orders table at the top level. Then you'd have uh, for, let's say, the first set of data that falls under January 1st, 1992, you would have like uh, a bunch of various org files that, that sit under there. 
And so when you run this query, if you were to have a query that said, uh, give me select all for the orders uh, where orders equal order date equals 1992-0101, then you would return this this big list of files that sit underneath that that data or underneath that uh, that that um, uh, folder or or um, directory. And you wouldn't have to go to the other directories, say January 2nd, January 3rd, or anything else. You now are only going to be touching the rows that are basically going to answer, or at least be candidates to answer the query that you're, you're uh, running here. So, um, so that's, that is um, what high partitioning is doing. Um, then we go on in episode six and seven. I kind of combine those two in terms of this, this look back because we talked first about kind of the planner and uh and you know mixed in a little bit of of information about the parser uh and then also then talked in episode seven about the cost base optimizer which we pulled in martin to, to discuss a few things about that so we kind of talk about how queries are internally represented and how they are optimized um so when you first get a query in you know we we, we get it as some text that is you know in the sql uh, hopefully valid sql and so the first goal is to basically get that into an abstract syntax tree and make sure that uh, that, that that initial syntax tree uh, is, is actually correct and, and this kind of thing. So once we have it in AST, we analyze it and make sure that, that uh, the tables and, and the logic there is, is making sense. So the analyzer moves it into uh, the next phase and then uh, basically validates the AST. And then from there, we have a planner that gets us into a different type of tree, uh, which is called a intermediate representation or IR. Uh, and that's kind of the first form of, of uh, how the cost base optimizer takes this, this tree representation of the query and starts basically applying various rules uh, and optimiz basically optimizations or planning optimizations uh, to, to basically make the, uh, a better plan that's going to run faster, that's going to use less resources, and ultimately uh, get you your data a lot faster, right? Um, we skip episode eight. That was the rebrand episode. And then we go to episode nine. And we talk a little bit about hash joins work. And I think one of the big concepts that I wanted to pull here it was more about like the nomenclature that we use around doing hash joins, which is like you're going to have a lot of times there's these two types of tables that you're going to have. You're going to have like a build side of the table and a probe side of the table. And the difference between these two is you'll have uh, a build side that is typically going to you're going to want to have that be the smaller table. And you're going to want to pull that data, that that table uh, into memory. Uh, so that you don't have to constantly pull that to disk every single time you're you're pulling in a new value on the probe side. It's kind of a nested loop type, you know, n squared type uh, algorithmic issue, right? So, um, so the ideal thing is to minimize the uh, the cost of actually reaching out to disk every single time uh, you're, you're you're running this. And so, the build table is alleviating a lot of this this extra work uh, that that we could be doing. And, um, and so we call that the build table because you're literally building that table in memory. Um, and then you would have a, uh, the other table in, in, in reverse is, is called the probe table. This is typically larger because you want to have the smaller table fit into memory. Um, and so, so we use that. We talked a little bit about uh, the hash join and how basically, you know, in, in distributed uh, type of joins, you know, we, we basically use a hash, hash function to split the different uh, parts of the data across the data sets uh, and then, uh, or sorry, split the different parts of the data across different workers. And, uh, and then once we were finished talking about that, uh, one last thing I wanted to kind of mention is, uh, is basically that there's this other nomenclature that is also used uh, that's based on the star schema. Uh, and it's called dimension and fact table. So usually when people are talking about a dimension and fact table, it, it's usually saying that there's a fact table. It means it's just a really big table. That's tip, that fact table is typically going to be what you're going to push into the probe side of your join. Um, the, the dimension table is a smaller table that just simply has like a list of uh, kind of context to associate with that fact table so that you can actually build up like more meaningful 
data that gets returned versus just a whole bunch of IDs. <laughs> uh, the fact table is a pretty boring table, actually, when you just look at it bare, bare bones. But then whenever you actually join it with things, it starts to actually have uh, useful data or useful information. So, um, so this dimension table is typically much smaller. And that's when we kind of get into this common uh, pattern of we, we want to use dimension tables typically as our build tables. So those will get easily distributed across uh, these, these workers uh, and, and, and basically pulled in and then um, uh, pulled into memory. And then we would have this probe table that would be this, this fact table that would, you know, ideally just, uh, just get, you know, streamed across as, as we do this join. So the last thing, and I'm just gonna touch, quickly touch on this, which is dynamic filtering. Um, dynamic filtering then is is the uh, another kind of extra <laughs> way that we can kind of optimize on on uh, how we how we are doing these these joins based on information that we get from the build table. So this is kind of what we're uh, the big takeaway from from dynamic filtering is we we can we have these build tables and they have some information. Basically, anything that is inside any any row. So let's, let's say we're joining on a particular column uh, called uh, ID or something like that. So if that ID column uh, is uh, you know any any value that sits in that ID column on the uh, build side or on that uh, that uh, uh, build table, the, that those IDs are basically absolutely required to be on the uh, e equal, at least we're talking about equijoin. Uh, there are other types of uh, uh, comparisons, but we're talking equijoin here. If you have a, basically a list of IDs that, uh, that meet some sort of criteria, you can now take these IDs and say, hey, these IDs uh, need to match for the pr anything on the probe side. So why would we want to do any work by like basically scanning and pulling any row from the probe side that doesn't meet this criteria. So you can actually take those IDs that are generated on the build side and you have to cleverly do this in a distributed machine. And this is the, this is the hard part <laughs> is you have to get all of these IDs somehow to the worker nodes that are uh, scanning these probe uh, or, or basically pulling in these, this probe, uh, these probe rows. And so, uh, so that's the the true like kind of art and difficulty that that kind of Renock and, and Carol are going to be kind of uh, covering with us today on how this is uh, working. So, uh, without further ado, you know, the PR of the week is the one that we we were also talking about the last time, and this is the one that uh, uh, Renock uh, was was doing. So this was back uh, June tenth of last year. Uh, finally got merged in. And um, so this was the first one that um, that actually took us from doing what we'll get more into what this means, but doing a local dynamic filter to actually involving the coordinator in a lot of this. And so um, I have a graphic to, to, to discuss this. But first off, um, I want to kind of hop back into interview scene and uh, see if Renak or Carol have any uh, commentary on on how good or bad I did at explaining <laughs> dynamic filtering, <laughs> and if there's any kind of corrections that any either of you uh, want to pull up or or just side notes. So I'll I'll pass it to Renak first. Do you have any anything? So that was actually quite good. <laughs> 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 do you want do you so uh did is there anything i kind of missed in, in any of that to kind of like uh you know like i mean i know there's, so there's a lot of complexity here that we're still missing uh obviously but but from a high level uh was there anything else like you or Car carol do you guys uh, have anything you just wanted to add before we maybe jump right into this like kind of visual example that i got No, I think it's a good, it's, it's a bit topic. Of course, there are, there's a lot of details <laughs> behind the scene, but on, on a high level, I think it's, it, 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 it's, 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 it's a, good, a good explanation. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. um, let me, let me real fast, uh, go through this, this type of thing and, and Renak, uh, can you kind of explain like, so w there's one thing of kind of understanding this, that. What, what basically needs to happen uh, is there needs to be a list that gets generated, but, but, you know, how does that get generated? And so basic understanding is like coordinator is going to get some, some query. So 
we get some query that's select all from some sales table and sales tables are our, our big fact table, right? It has a huge amount of rows and we, we, you know, we want to try to avoid, um, basically unnecessary, unnecessary scanning, uh, and, and, or particularly transmitting of this data, uh, where, where this day, you know, it's going to be like over overwhelmingly taking a lot of time. Right. And then we join yeah. that on items table. Uh, we join them by, by this item ID. And then we say where items price is greater than a thousand. Uh, I stole this from Ramon Z, <laughs> who, who, uh, who did the first kind of local version of this, but today we're actually talking how this would work, uh, in a, in a partitioned, basically assuming that the sales is partitioned on, on, uh, this, this item ID. So, um, just, just to like uh, interject for a second here. Sure. Uh, one thing that's very important when you look at this picture is that the sales table is like has a lot of items in it. That's why it's like a big blue box and the items one is small and green. Um, it's small and somehow Trino knows about that. And that somehow is the table statistics. Mm. So unless the system gets table statistics and knows that a table is big and another table is small and also in comparison, right? Like um, the items table could potentially be either side in a different query. So for this to work at all, the system needs to know the table statistics of like how many records are in this table even. So it can make those kind of decisions. And that's um, what's visualized here in the size of the boxes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's a super valid point. Like stats, you can't do any of this without stats. And in particular, uh, what we're gonna get to here later is like, uh, for the kind of coordinator level uh, type of dynamic filtering, you you also need to have this sales table partitioned as well, right? Uh, there are you can still have some level of dynamic filtering happen if uh, if your your probe table isn't partitioned. But maybe I can ask uh, Renak, can you kind of go into some of the details about like what what uh, what is the difference between let's say a local and uh, and kind of the um, a, a partition level uh, coordinator or partition level um, dynamic filtering that involves like the coordinator instead. Right. So, uh, so in this example that you're showing here, so you, you go to the second slide. So, uh, so let's assume that uh, this is a partition join. Mm -hmm. So what's going to happen is that uh, like you have this item stable and uh, we're going to hash partition it and send a portion of it to each worker. Mm -hmm. Now, um, each of those workers uh, is already aware about uh, the dynamic filter from the plan fragment that it has received from the coordinator. Mm -hmm. So like we assume that the optimizer has done its work and put in the dynamic filter at the right place in the plan. Okay, so let me ask a question right there. So that's already different from a standard broadcast join, right? Like in the standard broadcast join, from all I understand, is the whole, like it's like theoretically, like the whole items table would be moved to each worker. And what you're saying here with the dynamic filtering, it already knows and is smart enough to say, well, actually, I can make this even more efficient if I chop it up into separate pieces and give each worker only a part of it. Is that what's happening? Um, so pa partition join is like a ex existing concept. Like, so dynamic filtering just uses it. So okay, so, so it I, sits on top of that. Yeah, yeah. So like in this case, uh, we started with a partition join. So uh, what's going to happen is that uh, as the build side is being processed on each of these worker nodes, each of them is going to uh, be collecting uh, like the values from the build side, uh, which correspond to the join key condition. So again, like based on the plan, it knows that uh, which columns it is interested in and it needs to uh, keep collecting those values. So, uh, and then like as and when the build side processing finishes, each of these workers is going to have to communicate the values that it has collected back to the coordinator. And why, so now, why is that? That's just so that the coordinator has like this, this entire list and can actually adjust the plan afterwards, kind of like on the fly based on, based on this list. So, uh, 
so so the plan exactly isn't changing so hmm. what's going on is that um, so un- unless you know like all the pieces from the different workers you uh, do not know like what is the complete filter so you cannot hmm. start filtering out at the coordinator level gotcha uh, because you will just have a partial picture so the advantage of sending things back to the coordinator is that uh, all the like operations around uh, creating splits uh, listing files in the partition all that is going on in the coordinator gotcha so once the coordinator has the full picture then regardless of whatever was your storage format and whatever was the join distribution type it can then like go ahead and start uh, just uh, like avoiding even listing the partitions which it doesn't need to read and then even for the partitions where it has started listing things mm-hmm. um, it can like asynchronously receive the dynamic filters and like avoid generating further splits from there okay and and if it, it at this point has it cre- like it hasn't sent any of the splits yet to the, to the workers regarding the sales table right this that gets delayed so that the all these steps on the build table can happen first right so uh, so that is like an optional optimization so by default uh, like we go ahead with actually reading the sales table uh, okay. because we don't know like whether or not the dynamic filter is going to come and when it's going to come so uh, that's why we don't pause the processing there but uh, like recently we did add a feature where uh, you can like tell the coordinator to delay uh, like scans on the sales side and like wait for the dynamic filter to appear first and then it will start listing so like yes. depending on the workload you can like figure out what works well for you so so the reason for that is that uh, if you have a very short query a very short very small join uh, you don't want to inc- introduce additional latency. So that's why we start reading splits in Hive before getting dynamic filters. Okay. In other connectors, it, it it's not necessarily the case, right? So for Hive, it, it's not a problem that you start reading the probe side. You can still apply the filter later on. If you have other connector that, for example, is issuing query to underlying art BMS somewhere, uh, you just have one chance of sending dynamic filter there. Mm. So for, for for other connectors, it's it's more beneficial to wait for the dynamic filter. But it, it's not a you know it's not a easy it's not a zero or one decision to wait or not. It's, it mm. kind of depends depends on the context. So this sometimes might require some tuning. Like for Hive, it's fine. But if you if you implement your own connector that uh, it seems uh, supporting dynamic filters mm-hmm. and you just have one chance of applying dynamic filters to your source, then you should try and wait for the dynamic filters a little bit more and uh, maybe tune the parameter. Maybe I should wait by default one second or 10 seconds or, okay. or, or more. And that's what this, software. that's what this uh, blocking timeout, uh, dynamic filtering probe blocking, blocking timeout uh, property is doing, I guess, right? That's for Hive. Yes, that's the Yeah, and this this is per, it's so it's a per connector type setting, and not all connectors are going to have this. Now, um, it is so you're saying it's more beneficial for others, but like, what's the what would the trade off be in Hive if I started pushing this this higher? Obviously, is like it's going to delay my query, but is that actually so? Is the trade off kind of like if I wait a little longer for my query to like to run, uh, and it's going to take a little extra time if I start bumping this number up? is that going to save me maybe on like how many resources I'm using, right? Is that, is that what yeah. you're ultimately saving yeah, on? You could save resources this way. That's true. But uh, when we introduce a new performance feature for Presto, we first don't want, we first think that we should not introduce any regressions to the existing code. So by not waiting by default, we preserve the current performance and only improve the cases. Hmm. Uh, while if we enable by de- it by default, like waiting for the filter uh, in Hive Connector, we 
yeah, that for some workloads that this could potentially introduce some uh, increased latency, for example. Mm. Gotcha. Okay. So uh, sorry to, to sideline us a little bit, but I was uh, that was a kind of interesting uh, uh, sub sub thing. I thought other people might also find interesting. <laughs> so yeah. okay, so so we we now are giving we we've basically given uh, this list uh, this dynamic filter list to the coordinator. It now has this this list that it's uh, working with. So um, that to basically do this pruning that you were were talking about. Um, what happens after that? So, uh, so now at this point, uh, like once the dynamic filter is complete, then like the coordinator just takes advantage and like just generates fewer splits, less fewer partitions, and uh, everything runs faster. So, like for the coordinator DF, like this is pretty much it. Then okay. like, we can talk about the node local uh, part if. Yep. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be, I mentioned to talk about that. So that that's different from what we have. So I'll keep the picture kind of ready, but let me just hop back here. So, so in contrast to what we just talked about, like we, this one's involving the, the one, this is the one that you actually implemented in, in, uh, 1072, right? Yep. So, so before that, uh, we had, uh, 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 uh Roman, uh, Zed, uh, from Verada. Uh, he he had kind of one of the earlier iterations, and this is kind of a more local uh, uh, taking taking over a uh, uh, broadcast versus splitting up the items. So can you yeah explain maybe the flow there? Yeah yeah. So like he had a very good insight that uh, like this coordinator DF requires a lot of complex coordination, and like, it's been kind of like uh, hanging around for a while. So. In case of broadcast joins, there's no need to like do internode communication, and you can just like take advantage there itself. Yep. So, uh, so the idea is like very simple that uh, in case of replicated joins, every node knows the whole build site, so like, it doesn't need to like wait for anything else from anywhere. Yeah. So, what it can do is that. Uh, if the probe site scan is also like part of the same stage, so it can just internally uh, read the dynamic filter that was collected from the build site within the same node. And then now uh, it can use that dynamic filter to uh, like just push it down to the ORC or parquet reader. And then over there, like you get the usual uh, stripe or row group level pruning that you get even with your static filters. Yep. So there was uh when when you did your uh your blog were you comparing against the local dynamic filtering or were you just comparing with zero dynamic or like no dynamic filtering at all when you were doing the uh uh probe uh the the uh dynamic uh partition pruning versus right. So at that point uh, the node local part was already merged and uh, on by default. So like all the improvements were on top of like whatever was already there. Gotcha. Okay. And, and your comparison was to just like zero dynamic filtering versus like dynamic partition pruning. I uh, know. Uh, so uh, like the node local dynamic uh, filtering was also like already there. Okay. So, oh, I, I, I think, uh, let me see. So particularly in this and these, uh, what is it? Oh, no, it's not this one. Um, I have it from here, this, uh, so actually like the, the, there is a like interesting reason why like the results are so stark, even though node local dynamic filtering is there. Mm -hmm. so, so the reason is that uh, when you do this node local dynamic filtering and the dynamic filters are being sent to your uh, ORC reader, uh, like the, the data there uh, may not be like laid out in the best possible way for all your uh, predicate push down to uh, like filter out the data. So uh, what's going on in the ORC parquet reader is that you have these min max in indexes for row groups and stripes and like for that to work really well uh, like ideally if you had sorted the data by the 
dynamic filtering columns then it might be that uh, those results would also have been really good but in, in this case like sort of uh, the situation was that uh, the orc data layout wasn't ideal and uh, which it won't be in practical scenario as well yeah and where, whereas for your uh, partition pruning it's uh, the partitioning is doing like a sort of indexing operation on the table okay got it got it got it so, so coordinator uh, coordinator dynamic filtering doesn't help yet that much with unpartitioned tables right so if that, that's where the local dynamic filtering helps the most Say, could you say that last part again? So local dynamic filtering helps for unpartitioned tables and coordinator mm. dynamic filtering helps for partition tables. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So when you're having to basically scan everything already, uh, you're, you're wanting to use local, the local dynamic filtering because you're not having to do all that extra work, uh, involving the coordinator, but then when you're uh, dealing with uh, things, uh, 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 basically a table, a probe table, where you know it's partitioned already, uh, then that's where it's going. You're going to basically say, "Hey, this is basically worth the cost of involving the coordinator because now I, I actually know I'm going to be able to cut out quite a bit of extra work here." Is that? I mean, coordinator is always involved because processing of dynamic filters is very inexpensive, so the additional overhead is negligible so mm. we always send them to the coordinator gotcha that's, 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 that's okay no decision here um so so back on to this this comparison here uh we looked at this this baseline and this dynamic partition pruning this this baseline was looking at uh how just without no no dynamic filtering at all or was this um uh was this with comparing local and um, and dynamic partition pruning. That's like, so, yeah, with, with node local turned on. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So that was, I think that was more my, my, uh, my question, my misunderstanding there. Um, uh, so from, from, from the perspective of seeing those performance enhancements, they already like pretty significant, uh, in both like in, in the dynamic partition pruning and then also when local filtering is happening, um, do you have some sort of understanding of how large like the benefits are? I'm, I'm kind of guessing that like, I mean, this is a guess now. Um, the benefits are getting even bigger when the, when does the overall table size that you are like querying versus the subset that you actually want to return um, is, is large. Like when that difference is large, then the, the savings of like the difference in terms of data you have to load is bigger. So the bigger the table you're actually querying, you end up essentially getting more benefits from it relative. Is that kind of true? I would say yes. Uh, well, I, I mean, this is all relative. So if, you, if your queries are 10 seconds, then if they are five seconds, that could be important for you, but maybe not. If your mm -hmm. queries are I don't know, half an hour versus five minutes, that's that's probably more noticeable. Uh, yeah, I mean, usually... So you do, do you see in practice with the test data that you've been playing around, do you see improvements like that? I know we like we had a little uh, TPCH test scenario that Brian is going to play around later, and we saw like a 3x factor, for example, in terms of improvements. So, what, so what sort of range of improvements do you see from like, you know, percentage values to whatever? Oh, I, I, I like you see the charts here, but in the there, there, there were some improvements in the meantime, so we pushed the boundaries even far, far further, uh, pretty significantly. So I, I don't know what would be the end to end improvement. I would say very drastic, actually. So, so, so uh, like say is... say like a ten times improvement is is easily like is is totally in the ballpark or. Yeah, a few times, four times plus something like that. I don't have the numbers. It depends on the connectors too, right? So for, for example, uh, we, we like, I mean, Star Wars have, has, has also RDBMS connectors that utilize that. And for some of the connectors, 
the the difference is even more drastic than than mm -hmm. for Hive. Mm -hmm. And is that because we're also able like the is that because like the indexes on those RDBMSs are like really good? Like I guess this would assume like they already have some sort of index that makes that scan a lot faster as well. Is that fair or? Well, uh, uh, maybe not indexes, but we save a lot. You can save a lot of bandwidth by pushing additional predicates to the underlying database. Like usually, what you have, if you have with with, with all kinds of tables, you partition them them by the temporal temporal columns. For example, date. Mm -hmm. So this is where dynamic filter gets you get the biggest gains. So you can imagine that uh, for a RDBMS like Oracle, if you can filter the data 10 times because you have data for 20 years, but you are only interested in two years, that would give you 10 times the gain. That, mm. that might not be necessarily the case uh, with the Hive connectors sometimes because like we mentioned, we um, we also we start reading the probes. We start enumerating the probes even before waiting for dynamic filters. But I would also say that Presto is pretty fast on 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 on, on, on distributed in in Hive connector. So uh, it's harder to squeeze uh, much more performance to already very fast uh, connector, right? You mean Trino, that, right? That's a good problem to have, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's already so ludicrously fast. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So without further ado, like I feel like let's let's we're we're talking all these kind of hypothetical numbers. Let's let's go ahead and run the demo, no? Um Yeah. Sure. So uh so we're we're running uh, a couple I mean th this is I basically based a lot of this off of uh Renox test setup here. Um you know there were a couple of these tables uh that that were set up so we we pulled in these these are all basically the fact tables of the TPC DS uh queries. Uh so we have um uh four worker nodes uh and then we're instead of our 4 8x large we got uh, our 5 4x large machines. Uh, so we got four of those workers and we have a coordinator on the, of, of the same size. Uh, we pulled in this data and, and partitioned it by, uh, by these date fields. Uh, and so, um, so when we have this partition, we're, we're going to be using the, uh, the dynamic filtering that, uh, that Renak, uh, is, is, uh, implemented in, in 1072. Um, and so let's go ahead and check that out first. I think the, uh, so we have our uh, our little cluster running here, and um, we what we want to do is uh, we've we've already logged in uh, using. Can I make that font a bit bigger, Brian? Yeah, let me. Can you guys see that pretty well? Yeah, that's good. Okay, cool. Um, so basically, we we've logged in. We're we're using the Hive catalog. We're using uh, SF100 schema. Um, so uh, just for an idea of like. Uh, let me see what's one of the, uh, we'll go with, I don't know which one's bigger, but we'll just do a count real fast of like select count and uh, from catalog sales. So just for anyone that's not familiar with the TPC Ash connector, it basically can, like it, it has the data built in it's just a connector, but it's basically like a pre-filled database with test data that you can use for benchmarks. And it has these different schemas, like from tiny to SF, like one, 10, 100, and so on. And the higher the number, the more data is in there. So you, there's a very useful kind of little connector because like basically just throw that one connector file onto your Arduino cluster. And then you have all this test data available that you can use to really put the pressure onto your cluster and yep. get it to spread a lot and work really, really hard. And that's essentially what we're doing here. And and basically, if you, I mean, if you look at the schemas here, uh, here are your options. We'll say uh, show schemas. Uh, and I don't know if I can do this whenever I have the catalog pre-selected. Let me see if that works. Uh, but TPC, it should still work. It should. Okay. Uh, so let's try Is it. TPCS? Yep. Yeah, so, it, we're, so we're using TPCDS. Uh, this has slightly bigger and more uh, 
uh, useful uh, uh, thing. But he, uh, it he, has the same scheme as it's just different data. TPCDS versus TPCH. Yeah, it's, it's very very similar. I feel it like... has the same schemas. They both have. Uh, I thought it was. Uh, it has the same schemas in terms of scale factors, but it has yeah. very different. So <laughs> we're using the two different versions of schema. I'm, I'm talking about schema from like the data is. Uh, yeah, no, data no, schema. Sorry, those schemas would, would be <laughs> Over, overloaded words, right? Um, so yeah, so typically if you're like running a local test, you can use Tiny and it's never going to be too too bad to run that like on your laptop or something. SF1, SF10 is, is where you start kind of experiencing a little things bigger and maybe start getting even a little too much for your laptop. So then SF100 is where we start kind of seeing slightly bigger uh, row, row counts and stuff like that. And so uh, if you really want to get to benchmarks, you're, you're looking at like, you know, SF100, SF1000. And I mean, as you go higher and higher, obviously. Yeah, so your catalog sales table, they had what, like 15 million or something? Yeah, so this is, yeah. no, 143 million. Oh. 140 million. So yeah. <laughs> so it's pretty significant. And, and I mean, we're, we're joining. So this, this query here actually does a union between a catalog sales and a web sales table. So they're actually like, you know, I, I it's maybe about a factor of two, maybe if web sales is about on the same order of catalog sales that you're pulling out from this, uh, big data set. But anyways, without further ado, let's, let's run the dang query. So, um, we're going to, Oh, you know what? I almost forgot. I want to do this without, so let me, uh, quick, quick uh, uh, property you can uh, set up is somewhere in here. It is right here. This uh, set session enable dynamic filtering equal false. Uh, so we were basically turning the dynamic filtering off. So this was like pre pre dynamic filtering with like not even local dynamic filtering. So let's turn that off. And by the way, I'm working on getting a PR to add that to the documentation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Nice to have that. So run this. Uh, really cool because we can now uh, watch this on the live. Uh, so it's in the planning phase. Um, we, this is also a very, it's a cold. So actually it may make sense to run this twice because this is going to be extra slow uh, in all fairness to to uh, this running without um, anything. So let's... Let's go ahead and run this uh, twice. So it's running now. We should be able to pull up the live plan. I don't know if it's going to zoom disable. Oh, pretty, pretty, yeah, pretty I forgot. This is the, the normal Trina web UI. Yeah. I I happen to be using a Starburst cluster right now, but but yeah, it's, it's very, uh, very, very similar. Yeah, the dynamic filtering features are all in Trino. Right, like on the Hive connector. Yep. Is that right, Carl and Renak? Yeah. Uh, the so core parts of it is. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing you can to for to help us later, we'll 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 be able to remember which one we're dealing with by seeing this nice little session properties view. Um yep. and uh seeing that which one we set false and then we'll we'll set this here to true once uh this is done running. So um this is the as the fun essence of doing this stuff live, right? <laughs> but well, it, oh. it's quite amazing actually. Like the the web UI really helps you there. Like you can literally see how Trino is grunting through the work and what's happening in terms of like especially also the plan, the live plan. Yeah. Um, you can see how it like tries to figure out what's going on, what data it pulls in, what it's like basically essentially gonna try to do. So. Um, there's a lot of detail here and you can like really dive in and start scratching your head over it. <laughs> so let me uh, go real fast and uh, copy this again because I don't feel like pushing up a million times <laughs> to get back over that query. So we're gonna set that now to true. So we've turned uh, dynamic filtering back on. Let's uh, run this one more time. And I'm actually going to run, I, I will, will run the uh, live plan or the, uh, um, I will run the uh, turned off dynamic filtering here in a second, uh, one more time, because that was a cold start. So it's kind of a, a ruthless way to compare. But if we did see, let's look at how long that actually took um, the last one. So that was a minute and four, one, one, one about one and a half minutes. Uh, for, uh, I think it's that CPU time and then, uh, wall time is about
about the same. So this one still running, we're at about 39 and it just finished. So finished in 40 seconds with the dynamic filtering on. So let's go ahead and take a look. Less than half. <laughs> About less than half, but let's we'll be fair, a little fair, and let's actually try to rerun the first one here in a second. But first thing I wanted to point out, I thought was uh, a great. Most of the the insights are going to be here down at these like kind of leaf nodes where we're actually pulling the data from uh, this lo this location, and uh, you're actually going to see a huge difference here. So uh, if we go into our query uh, live plan we'll see that the data here is 600 megabyte and 120 megabyte. And these, these get union together. So this is coming from the, uh, what I had showed before in that uh, query. We have web sales data and we have catalog sales data. So let's go look at where that was at. So that's at this, this union all here. So we're literally pulling these together into a kind of a single, uh, like a extra set of rows and, uh, so we have catalog and web going into the same thing. So if we go back to the live plan. That's what this this is doing right here is we're actually just merging these into one one piece. And uh, you'll notice that the dynamic filters that get sent down here, uh, this is actually, uh, you know, basically passing down that set of, um, in this case, it's the I, item SK value. So if you look at the join, it's uh, item underscore SK equals I item SK. So that's this particular uh, predicate right there. So we see since that pushdown happened, we only had to scan in 600 megabyte and 120 megabyte. And we compare that over here. That's 3.64 gigs plus 1.83 gigs. So it's pretty significant. Uh, and that makes sense why why you're going to see that that uh, level of, of, of difference. And if we had... You know, if we had gone up to the scale factor that was even higher than this, we would we would see a much more significant difference. But let, let me do that one thing I had just kind of said. Uh, oh my God, I need to have this ready. I think that there's a shortcut for that. If you type set session and press up, like it will. Oh, it'll. That one. No way. I, I I learned new so many. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. <laughs> 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 there's some this i, I gotta say real fa like just a quick aside about the, our our cli is just that it freaking rocks <laughs> because it like it's just so cool how when you get these results back that it's basically like just the less command and you can just go like pro, like go up and down and you can actually change that too uh, this is something dane taught me is you can if you wanted your your command uh there's like uh your 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 results to come back and like open up in vim you could actually have it open up in Vim if you wanted to. <laughs> like yeah, there's 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 a there's a good tool that's uh, custom written sort of as a like command line sort of like renderer for Postgres, but you can put that in as an as a replacement, um, and then it like does the nice table layout with like ASCII characters and stuff for that. So yeah, yeah, it's 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 insane how much work and and how cool like how I don't know just there's. And something new I always learn about the CLI every day. And so this was another another quick and easy one. So thank you for that, Renak. <laughs> you, you can uh, tell that Renak and Carol are using that thing every day. Yeah, <laughs> not us, not like us losers. <laughs> just sitting here on broadcast, toying around with the CLI, and we're just like, whoa. <laughs> All right. So I actually, I actually also could learn about this quite recently. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> I don't yeah. feel. Thanks for thanks for making me feel a little bit better, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's command completion and all sorts of cool stuff in there. Yeah. Yeah, we need to... Uh, uh, query is running. Like, you can actually go and see the query in for JSON and, like, look at the dynamic filter that was actually collected. So... That would give a more concrete view of what happened. You're talking about in the UI or is, like, the, the JSON that, that pops up, like, over here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, this... Or, or is this something that you can do in the CLI, like some? Um, so in the web UI, like you can uh, go to the oh. query info JSON. Yeah, I just like realized the, the very last, uh, the very last. I, yeah, that's. I realized I wasn't showing my screen. So yeah, what I what I did was I came back to the live plan for one of these, and I and I opened up this JSON plan. Um, yeah, actually, can you speak to some of the benefits? Uh, a lot of people uh, get confused whenever we ask them for this, like in in Slack channel, and they'll they'll send this over. Uh, this basically has like everything that the, the UI has and I guess more. Is that like 
Yep. So everything that you see in the UI, like it comes from here. Okay. And gotcha. maybe like one or two more sources, but at least the query level info is all like basically from here. Oh, cool. So it's good for sharing debugging information. Basically. Yep. And in th this one, like you can see, like there's a field called dynamic filter stats and oh, uh, th nice. that will like exactly show you what's the filter that it built and like sent and used in the coordinator. Uh, underscore filter? Um, so it should be uh, camel cases. Oh, okay. Dynamic Dian filter stats. Uh, is that is that right or? Mm. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Filters yeah. stats. Okay. Yeah, filters. <laughs> oh man. So this is yeah. So this is basically everything that was used in across this, and this is actually kind of hard to read because we have so many. But but uh, if you so if you wanted to actually correlate, let's see, what was it here? So if you if you pulled this out and you said okay this is DF three two zero six for that uh, that sold date SK then that's actually you you can go to DF <laughs> what did I just say <laughs> three three two zero six three two yeah, we, should, we should call it better names for the filters <laughs> hey no that's fine I mean as long as you can oh here we go and so these were the simplified domains so this these were the two like literally the this is the list of yeah. of I of IDs that were sent over. Right. It's yep. simplified, but yeah. Okay. Okay. That's cool. That's really cool. <laughs> That's uh. But what's What's interesting there is that you can take a look and you know it tells you how long it took to collect the dynamic filter on the coordinator. So this is kind of interesting. Oh, cool. So it, this could actually help you determine if you needed to, uh, if you well, let's say if it wasn't worth your time to to basically uh, run these or to, to basically have dynamic filtering run for a query. Is there, is there cases where you don't want, like you explicitly want to turn it off? So I know we had it disabled in the beginning when we were kind of like in beta phase and then we eventually made that normal to, to have it turned on. Why would somebody turn off dynamic filtering? Uh, I think it should be on by default. Okay. It's on by <laughs> default, but it's, it's designed in such a way the, lim the default limits are so so uh, set in such a way that it should not introduce any regression. Gotcha. And it should only give you benefits. So so a little bit better run this time when we turned it off and, and we had it warmed up. Uh, so one uh, we had a, about a minute and, and about like we'll say a quarter. A minute and a quarter, but still like comparing to a it's minute still, and a quarter to 40 half, seconds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, practically half. So so that's good. Um, I, I, I mean, yeah, so exactly half, right? So um, so I, I think like, I mean, that's that's uh, that's pretty awesome. There's a couple uh, uh, pieces that we also wanted to cover. Let me uh, pull that up. So, so that's more or less the demo there, but I wanted to also... Uh, go into a couple other uh, aspects. So one of them, oh yeah, here is the one I wanted to check out. So we have semi joins, right? Uh, this, these are kind of special cases. Can uh, one of you, uh, like either of you, kind of uh, feel like talking about semi joins and what makes that a different? I mean, we this was a whole a whole entire different implementation from the original, right? Like how you guys had to uh, accomplish this and, and what makes it different. Carol, you want to take that? Well, uh, it's not that different. Okay. Because uh, I mean, we collect dynamic filters by the set by using a separate operator, so we don't have to change a lot in the, the in the other operators really. So it's only most it's mostly planner phase uh, planner changes. Uh, so and this was pretty pretty quick to implement, to be honest. Uh, and actually, there's another thing that recently we actually changed that semi joins, the one that do filtering, are replaced uh, by inner joins. So in Presto now, it's very you can very rarely see a semi join okay. in in a planner. Uh, and this was actually because uh, semi joins were not taking part in CBO too much. Uh, it's hard to flip sides of, of semi joins, so 
by making them inner joins, we actually improved a couple of queries quite significantly. Okay. Yeah, and, and just to be clear, uh, so semi join is is where one of the tables, or pr and like part particularly like an inner table, uh, is is not uh, is basically you're not pulling you're not like pulling back any of that data. You're not you're you're basically get it, using it to get some sort of aggregate, but you're not actually returning any of that data. Is that correct? Kind of a, a, a silly way to, or how would you define semi join? So I would define it as a, as this is a set operation. So you have a one element and you ask, oh, is that element part of that set? Uh, is it or not? Uh, and when, it, when it's filtering semi-join, you will immediately later drop such elements that are not part of the other set. Uh, but you can also use it in projections. So if, if you write select uh, X in Subquery, you would get a result true or false, uh, whether X is in that other set. And this is also realized by semi join. So that's a non filtering semi join. It makes it creates a projection that gives you this Boolean. So this is very, very similar to inner join, especially when it's filtering. Uh, but there are some differences. So there is a special handling for nulls, right? So if you have a you have a let's say x in uh, one two three uh, comma null uh, null is treated as I don't know so a result of, of such of that expression x in null would be null so this is this is a little bit different than how it works with inner joints. Um, Renak, mm -hmm. Renak actually gave me an, uh, an example. Let me see if I can try to run it, uh, real fast. And then we can maybe even talk to that a little bit. Um, oops, Here. let me, so let me know if you can see, see this. So this is like a select on a date and you're doing a count, uh, from store sales. And then you're saying where it's in. And then we have this kind of nested query that's, uh, basically pulling, um, from web sales, uh, and web sales is, uh, we're, I mean, I think to me, I, I was thinking like the idea is that we're not actually the, that we're not actually, uh, returning any of the data other than this, this particular column from, from web sales for this equity from this semi join, I mean, um, so, yeah. Um, so, so like in English, like I would say that like this query is looking at uh, uh, the dates from web sales, uh, which have the highest sales mm -hmm. and then uh, looking at the sales in stores for those dates. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So, but you're the, I think the, the cool part about this is that you're not really returning a lot of data from web sales. You're really just using that to get a, that that what uh, um, Carol was saying is like this set of the basically this list to kind of determine, you know, what what to re actually return on the store sales side, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. So we'll run that and let's see what happens on the query plan side. So Renak and Carol, you both oh. are like working on a bunch of other uh, performance improvements and have since then, is that what's happening? What's 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 currently on your on your radar on on your plate? What are you doing? Oh, so uh, like I said, in the meantime, there were some significant improvements to dynamic filtering. There were some other improvements to Presto related to joins, how they're executed. Uh, there were some improvements to how the rank function was being executed. So that was the I slowest have query. I not recently. Yeah, that was the slowest query from all of the TPCDS, like one third of the, uh, around one third of the total wall time of the one terabyte TPCDS. Uh, uh, we are planning actually to land further dynamic filtering improvements and maybe Rana, you could take, talk a little bit more about this. And this would give another, I would say around 15% overall improvement in Trino. So, so yeah, so we have some good, mm, good topics to work on, uh, and expect further improvements 
between them. So how, how, how do you know like what to attack in terms of performance? Do you compare with other tools or do you just oh. look at the benchmarks or do you get a lot of like feedback from people that have queries that say, well, this one is really slow and I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. all, of, all of it. So we do bench, we do all ideas. We try them experimentally with benchmarking. We have feedback from the customers. We have input from comparison with different tools. Um, we have some, you know, pain points from our, from our clients, from users. Uh, from community, so yeah, so there is a, there is a lot of inputs. Like, um, but I would say we have, uh, um, yeah, we have we are pretty busy with with the with the with what can be improved. Like, there is a lot, there is so much things that can be improved. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there is more work than hands. <laughs> Well, it's, it's hard to find people like Ronak that like, you know, understand all the complexities and like, or yourself, right? Where it's not just, yeah, you can it, just take some graduate mm -hmm. student out of a university and go, go for it. <laughs> like there's a lot to learn. Well, right? there is a lot, there's a lot to learn. Like, I would say it's more about getting familiar with the project and the domain. So this is, uh, this, this is a knowledge here. Uh, yeah, I mean, everybody can have good ideas, right? So it's someone, someone yeah, could come fresh, fresh and see something that we don't see, right? So there is still, there is a lot of place for improvement. Yeah, that's cool. Well, um, to be honest, this this query is not finishing anytime soon. Uh, first time I I ran it. Oh, here we go. So first time, <laughs> uh, first time I ran it, uh, uh, I actually had to cancel uh, the one that we had going before because uh, um, because I had still had the dynamic filtering turned off, and it was at already at two minutes, and I basically just had to cancel that. So if we look at the uh, if we look at the failed this failed one here, this was at like two minutes and two, two point ten uh, minutes. Right. So I was just like this, this isn't going to finish within the time and we need to start wrapping this up. Right. So this actually with dynamic filtering finished in a minute, let's, let's quickly jump into this. Uh, so this is how we would see, um, the semi join being handled. And so, uh, I'm actually going into this blind, so I might actually need some help from, uh, from Carol or Renock to kind of uh, make sense of this. So, this is, uh, we need to look for the one where we're, where we're actually, if we look at the query, we're actually looking for web sales, right? To see what was passed down to web sales to kind of understand. Store sales. Say again? Store sales. Oh, just store, store sales. Okay. So this is, this has this dynamic filter, which is the sold date disk. And that is pulling from. There's a higher filter predicate. Is that filter predicate have have anything to do? No, that's that just has to do with the uh, the external, like uh, we're between big int and big int. Uh, let me go back to the query one more time because so we have these two um, this filter that's that's set up here. Oop, I'm getting mixed up here. Let me just close out the rest of these. Here, so uh, are you guys able to see that at all? Yeah. So, so sold date uh, SK is between this range. Is that actually coming from, and is not, and or it's null? Is that coming from this? How we handle this uh, semi join, or do we have to actually look at the dynamic filter seven four eight there to understand that better? Yeah, so you would just like look at the dynamic filter, and then yeah, I think the rewrite of semi join to inner join has also happened here. Oh, <laughs> that's so. In that case, uh, with with what uh, Carol had just said, we basically got rid of the semi join, and so we we no longer. I feel like you can also try turning that off. And... <laughs> <laughs> then you will see the actual same event. Well, uh, assume so. How would let's just talk through how this would have happened? Uh, so, what would have actually ended up happening would have been we wouldn't see this join here, right? 
this inner join exactly. is is what got instead reared. of inner join it would say semi join like uh, otherwise it would more or less look the same like the shape doesn't change that much okay and in terms of the actual implementation and in terms of di dynamic filtering um we this one actually ends up pulling from what the web sales or is this actually here this is pulling yeah, web sales okay and this is actually generating that that uh that set that we're basically trying to say only only these that uh that come into the scan filter so um so what actually when we we've changed this to an inner join but like uh in terms of implementation from a dynamic dynamic filtering perspective what changed from what we i guess described earlier in the powerpoint slides um so not a whole lot actually so 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 let, let's say like instead of the inner join rewrite it was still a semi join mm -hmm. so what would have changed is that uh, like now the optimizer would try to plan a dynamic filter for the semi join node as well yeah uh, and then like on the execution side again uh, j just like uh, it knows how to um, insert the dynamic filter source operator for the build side of inner joins it would do the same for semi join as well cool okay well that makes sense um so i mean i think we're pretty much at time like uh, is there anything else uh, we kind of missed that uh, uh i'll start with you renok did you have anything you wanted to kind of uh, talk about regarding like dynamic filtering or, or any other thing that uh, people should be aware of uh, looking forward to on this I know we covered a little bit of the future um, um yeah I, I guess like uh, one positive development is that like we also saw like community members um, get interested in like adding dynamic filtering to other connectors so like, we had somebody like put up a PR for kudu that got merged and somebody was working on iceberg so yeah in the, this is a easy way to contribute like plenty of connectors in open source and yeah be straightforward to like just keep adding dynamic filtering support for those is iceberg still in progress for for dynamic filtering right now yeah yeah i think that pr is still like work in progress cool well, I'll definitely have to check that out. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't aware. I was, I, I was waiting to see, like, I looked in to see if there was any dynamic filtering before the show and, and I was like, oh man, it's not an iceberg yet. Okay. Well, whatever. <laughs> um, how about you, Carol, anything else you'd like to kind of point, uh, users or at least say be, about dynamic filtering before we, uh, we hop off. Mm, I would say expect further, further improvements of either of dynamic filtering or other, uh, other means. Uh, so we are constantly trying to push that here. Awesome. Yep. Well, thanks a lot for joining the show today, guys. Uh, uh, Manfred, anything you'd like to share before we hop off? No, um, I think, um, this has been awesome. Uh, thanks for joining us guys. Um, there's definitely a lot of details and for anyone interested, make sure you check out our show notes and also the blog post and stuff like that, that links to. Um, the other thing I wanted to uh, mention is I'm really looking forward to completely change subject next time when we uh, talk about the whole client side tone usage. And actually, I think you have a guest from the Apache Superset project, yep. is that right? Srini, yeah. He's a developer advocate over at Preset. Uh, he is uh, going to be talking about, uh, so um, Preset is the uh, one of the enterprise solutions that sits around uh, Superset. Uh, yeah, so... so so we're going to be uh, talking a little more uh, visual at that point and kind of seeing how Presto is used from a, from a client aspect. Yeah, it's going to yeah. be really fun. So I'm looking forward to that. It should be very interesting as well. Yeah. And we'll see you later next time. Yep, yeah. definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no CLI next. Well, I mean, we could always well, still well, use maybe the CLI. We'll do a CLI episode <laughs> sometime. I think that's a, probably a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I think just literally talking the whole time on CLI, we need to bring uh, David and, and Renak and just have them uh, show show you and I a couple pointers on, on that. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, uh, only other thing I wanted to add before we hop off is, uh, you know, we, we have these user testimonials uh, that we've been uh, getting slowly uh, increasing on the Trino site. Uh, and uh, basically it's, uh, here, let me let me just pull that up while we're Yeah, it's like two dozen or something now. Yeah, it's getting... We're actually changing the layout so it's not so many. <laughs> well, so it's still as many, but it's not as big on your, on your mobile device. Yeah, so... But yeah, thanks for everyone that 
brought some up and um, we're always happy to get more at it. Anyone that is using it, it can even be just a logo. But of course, if it's an actual testimonial, that's even better. Yep, definitely. So yeah, if, uh, if uh, and you can get uh, any, if you're not sure what to say in your testimonial, you know, you just kind of read what uh, some of the existing companies that uh, have already put some out there, you can kind of get an idea of, of what most people talk about. And then you can also give us a website uh, where we can actually point you to, uh, you know, your 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 company's website or, or in particular, like an engineering blog or something like that. Exactly. Um, and then, uh, you know, another call out is, uh, we you know want to always get the community involved in other ways than just uh, coding, which we are very happy for those of you that are contributing code. But also, you know, if uh, if you're um, doing something really cool, uh, you know, uh, like uh, Renock was a while back with uh, with all this dynamic filtering stuff before we had it, um, you know, write a blog about it and, and tell us, you know, if you've done some cool benchmarks and seen some really interesting insights. Uh, we we want to know about what's happening in the Trino community and uh, hearing from people other than just you know me writing blogs about random stuff. <laughs> so, uh, so with that, um, you know, thank you uh, both again for uh, joining our show and, uh, until next time, uh, uh, thank you all for joining us as well on, uh, Twitch and, and, uh, YouTube and, and all the other platforms that we, uh, put this out on the podcast as well. So thank you all. And, uh, music for the show is, uh, by Mega Man six gameplay by Christoph Slawakowski and, uh, see you all next time. <laughs>